Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, today we will start to present a subject on the gastroesophageal reflux disease in infant and the children. Our ILOs will be uh, the pathophysiology of the reflux, the barriers against reflux, clinical manifestation and diagnostic evaluation, also medical and operative management, post-operative care, complications of fundal glycations, and finally the outcome. At first, we must know what is the difference between the gastroesophageal reflux and the gastroesophageal reflux disease. Gastroesophageal reflux means involuntary backward or backflow movement of the gastric content into the esophagus, with or without regurgitation or vomiting. However, gastroesophageal reflux disease defined when the reflux affecting infant or a child quality of life or causing some complications, such as failure to grow appropriately, respiratory complications, whether acute or chronic, esophagitis, feeding or sleeping problem, and the most serious apnea or apparent life-threatening spills. Uh, regarding the etiology of gastroesophageal reflux, the most common pathophysiology is inappropriate transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, independent of swallowing. Commonly seen in infants as they eat more with increased gastric distension and usually resolve by two years of age without treatment. Regarding the pathophysiology of the gastroesophageal reflux disease, we start with the mechanism. The primary mechanism is the transient inappropriate lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, resulting in the presence of the gastric content in direct contact with the esophageal mucosa. Uh, there is a large debate about the type of the reflux. Is all refluxes acidic or alkali? Initially, reflux is thought to be purely acidic. However, with recent researches that indicated that up to 40% of reflux is not acidic. Also, many children have non-acid or weak acid reflux. Moreover, the respiratory symptoms reported more frequently when GERD was non-acidic. Number three, other substances may be incriminated in the reflux, including the bile salt, pepsin, trepsin. All these substances increase the esophageal mucosal injury by increasing the permeability of the esophageal mucosa to the already present acid, thus further potentiating more injury, so they are more toxic in the presence of acid reflux. What are the consequences of these reflexes? All of us know that in adult, the consequence will be limited to three items, whether erosive esophagitis, esophageal structures, Barrett esophagitis. However, in children, consequences are much broader with the same adult complications, plus may be pulmonary effectus, reactive airway disease and pneumonia, malnutrition, Abnic spills, which is the most dangerous one, apparent life threatening spill or near infant mess. Now we go to speak about the barriers against the gastroesophageal reflux, physiological barriers by which the body prevents reflux to occur. Number one, factors preventing reflux, including lower esophageal sphincter, uh, intra abdominal lens of the esophagus, and angle of his. Lower esophageal sphincter is the most important factor. It creates a high pressure gradient in the distal esophagus. Its ability to prevent reflux related to its position, its length, and pressure, provided that the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation is normal. Regarding gill position, usually phrenoesophageal membrane hold the lower esophageal sphincter in position and create pressure gradient in the distal esophagus. However, some cases of mal malpositions may be seen with hiatal hernia, abnormal development, and will lead to development of reflux. Regarding pressure, in adult studies, lower esophageal sphincter pressure more than 
30 will prevent reflux. However, if the pressure dropped below six millimeter mercury, reflux happen. In children, reflux episodes rarely correlate with a decreased lower esophageal sphincter pressure uh, when the children were evaluated with pH and manometry. Regarding relaxation, lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, normal relaxation occur with esophageal peristalsis during swallowing, and there is no reflux episode reported with this type of relaxation. However, reflux reported with inappropriate transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Uh, so lower esophageal sphincter failure may be due to all of these items, maybe abnormal position within the chest, maybe short lens, increased frequency, abnormal smooth muscle function. The second item, which is very important, is the intra-abdominal lens of the esophagus. No absolute effective intra-abdominal esophageal lens that prevent uh, gastroesophageal reflux. However, correlation between several lenses and the GERD have been reported in adult studies. Uh, in adult, maybe intra-abdominal esophageal lens of three to four and a half centi with normal abdominal pressure will prevent reflux. If the lens fall below one centi, result in re reflux in more than 80% of patients. So adult surgeon believe that unsuccessful or recurrent anti-reflux surgery is due to failure to mobilize adequate intra-abdominal esophageal lens. On the other hand, pediatric surgeon believe that extensive esophageal mobilization in the absence of hiatus hernia is harmful. Regarding the angle of Hess, it is the angle at which the esophagus enters the stone. Usually, it is an acute angle, which creates what's called flap valve mechanism at the gastroesophageal junction. When this angle becomes obtuse, the gastroesophageal reflux is reported. Also, on the other side, accentuation of the angle inhibits the reflux. Ability of the angle to prevent reflux may be diminished as a result of abnormal development, and most commonly, uh, after gastrostomy placement, which may be iatrogenic cause. With normal angle, there is a rosette-like mucosal configuration collapse on itself with increased intragastric pressure, acting as weak anti-reflux valve. Uh, regarding the summary of this subject, we can conclude that infant and the children at increased risk for the gastroesophageal reflux may be children with increased abdominal pressure, which may be neurologically related, in neurologically impaired the child, physiological uh, related, maybe the effect of obesity, ascites, peritoneal dialysis, or maybe some anatomical abnormalities like gastroschisis and omphalocele. Number two, children with congenital defects will be more liable for the gastroesophageal reflux. Congenital short esophagus, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, hiatal hernia, esophageal atresia. Some studies in esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula found that these children have abnormal esophageal peristalsis with incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, and about 30 will require anti reflux surgery. Also, on the other side, in congenital diaphragmatic hernia, anatomical abnormalities of the esophageal hiatus predisposed to GERD, and about 20% uh, will require anti-reflux surgery. The second item to prevent reflux is esophageal clearance. Once the barrier to prevent reflux has been overcome or filled, the role of esophageal clearance is very important here regarding peristalsis, saliva, and the gravity. Uh, the esophageal motility or peristalsis, we have three types of esophageal motility, primary motility or primary peristalsis initiated with the swallowing and responsible for about 90% of the esophageal clearance from any reflux. Secondary peristalsis initiated after reflux has occurred and the clearance is required, especially during sleep. And finally, what's called the tertiary uh, motility or peristalsis, which have nothing to do with esophageal clearance as it is sporadic non-propagating contraction. 
So vagal motility is impaired in certain diseases, such as abnormal smooth muscle function or impaired vagal stimulation. So the reflux are not moved away in a proper time. This will cause more inflammation, more injury to the esophageal mucosa and the vagal stimulation with more motility disturbance. Saliva, yes, saliva neutralizes the refluxive material, lubricating the esophageal content, also decrease the salivary secretion reported in some patient with gastroesophageal reflux. The final items uh, in the esophageal clearance is the gravity. Gravity may assess in the clearance of esophageal reflux. This evidence by positional effect in related to the treatment of the gastroesophageal reflux, which is very important. Now we will speak shortly about the esophageal functional development in a child. The flaccid milk backflow that was observed in more than half of the children and considered normal, provided that it's not affecting the child development. It is believed to be immature lower esophageal sphincter with absence or low tone. However, studies documented that the newborn have a normal tone and pressure in their lower esophageal sphincter. So the reflux mostly due to frequent and prolonged transient esophageal relaxation with delayed esophageal prestalysis. Or it may be a form of central delay in the development of the motor coordination of the esophagus as it is common in infant with central apnea, indicating that there is more immature central regulation causing frequent transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Regarding the clinical manifestation of gastroesophageal reflux disease, the presentation in children is variable and depend on the patient age, the medical condition of the child, the patient characteristic. So surgeon must consider this variation when evaluating a child with possible gastroesophageal reflux disease. The symptoms may be seen in children and infant, maybe regurgitation with or without vomiting, respiratory symptom, irritability and discomfort of the child, dysphagia, and finally hemorrhage. Regarding regurgitation and vomiting, persistent regurgitation, a moist pillow is a typical sign that reflux reach the mouse. Number two, vomiting. Vomiting, however, in infant and the children, often physiological and named as calesia of infancy, usually seen early in life after feeding or when the infant placed in recumbent position. However, this calesia is self-limited with most infant being asymptomatic by the two years of age. Also, this calesia don't interfere with the child development or causing any complications. On the other hand, when the vomiting due to gastroesophageal reflux disease, it usually associated with severe malnutrition and gross failure uh, due to insufficient caloric intake. Number two, respiratory presentation, which is very common. And excluding gastroesophageal reflux disease as the cause of all the respiratory symptoms of the child is very challenging for the surgeon due to the similarity of the symptoms between GERD and between the respiratory symptoms. And that aspiration may be caused by oropharyngeal dysmotility and not by gastroesophageal reflux disease. So respiratory symptoms attributed to GERD may be in the form of chronic cough, wheezing, shocking, apnea, uh, recurrent bronchitis or pneumonia, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, or sudden infant death syndrome, which is very serious, or uh, sometimes called near infant mess. Uh, what about the effect of the gastroesophageal reflux on premature infant with respiratory problems? As we know, premature infant may have a respiratory distress syndrome or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. In respiratory distress syndrome infant, gastroesophageal reflux was responsible for deteriorating pulmonary status requiring intubation. 
If the child or infant have a bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the GERD also will be responsible for the deterioration of the pulmonary status, failure to thrive, and anorexia. Irritability and discomfort, very common presentation. Infant present with unexplained persistent crying due to painful esophagitis. Despite all conservative measure, this child is still crying. In children, retro-external burning pain may be present as in adult. Uh, however, it is not common. The most common is recurrent pain in the upper abdomen. Plus, intolerance of the acid uh, or sweet food, sore mouth odor, gurgling sound in the chest after eating. There is what is called Sandifer syndrome. Sandifer syndrome means uh, there is a recurrent tick-like sideway inclination of the head to the left side, may be interpreted as trial for passive prevention of the reflux by the child. Sandifer syndrome is common presentation. Finally, dysphagia. Dysphagia will develop as a result of severe mucosal inflammation. This mucosal inflammation will set a vicious circuit characterized by the disturbance of the secondary peristalsis, more numerous lower esophageal sphincteric relaxation. Then the inflammation spread to the deeper layer. If swallowing difficulties or food regurgitations occur, this indicating that esophageal structure developed, which is very important. Also buried Osophagitis may develop, which is uncommon in children. However, if it developed, serious complication may result. Risk for adenocarcinoma, about 50% of the children may develop structures or may develop ulceration. A children with mental disabilities is an important uh, subset of the children because they are an exception, because they are unable to articulate their difficulties or express their impressions regarding pain, regarding retrosternal sensation. However, appearance of symptoms of autoaggression should be considered as an important sign of painful esophagitis and should uh, always be taken as a reason to investigate for reflux disease in this subset of children with mental disabilities. Finally, hemorrhage, which is uncommon presentation, may be mucosal inflammation lead to microhemorrhage of the mucous membrane and chronic hemorrhagic anemias. A uh, small percentage of the children may be present uh, to the clinic with melina or hematochesia. Now we will shift to the diagnostic evaluation of gastroesophageal reflux disease. The history and the examination remain the cornerstone for diagnosis and extremely helpful when evaluating child need for the anti-reflux surgery. And by some surgeon, consider it sufficient to proceed with the management. Diagnostic evaluation usually required in children uh, requiring fund duplication or cases with unclear diagnosis. Uh, the uh, well-known contrast upper uh, GI study will give us idea about the morphology and the anatomical abnormalities, the associated anomalies, most commonly mal rotation, evidence of aspiration of the contrast during the examination may be sign of reflux. However, it is not helpful in determining the severity of the patient's symptoms, which is very important. Number two, Absence of the reflux on the dye study doesn't exclude reflux. Why? Because the examination time is very limited and this examination time or very short. So reflux may not occur during the few minutes of fluoroscopy. So please consider these items. Number three, the sensitivity of the upper GI in many recent studies for diagnosing reflux when comparing with BH was about 30%. Also, the sensitivity in detecting other abnormalities, such as malrotation, uh, in recent studies, about 4.5%. Uh, 
Uh, also, in recent studies, there was only four unexpected findings in about 572 cases in which the upper GI affecting the subsequent decision regarding surgery or gastrostomy placement. However, despite all these data, most pediatric surgeons still re uh, request the preoperative upper GI before anti reflux surgery. The second investigation is a 24 hour BH monitor, which was the gold standard for diagnosing GERD reflux, GERD disease over the past 30 years, most frequently used to diagnose acid reflux. However, its weakness is still that it doesn't demonstrate refluxes with a neutral or mildly alkaline BH. Number three, very important, multi-channel intraluminal impedance, which is very sensitive for evaluating gastroesophageal reflux disease in children, particularly good at detecting non-acid reflux. Differentiate between anti-grade flow and retrograde flow, which is the reflux. Accurately detect the height and type of the reflux, height of the reflux, if reflux reaching the lower esophagus only, middle esophagus or upper esophagus, and determine the type liquid, gas, or mix it. Nowadays, the combined multi-luminal uh, impedance with BH monitoring is the most superior to BH monitoring alone, especially in young infant, as symptoms in young infant mostly due to weakly acidic or neutral reflexes. Uh, it will diagnose most patient with non-acid reflux, and this is very important in the treatment because this type of patient with non-acid were requiring different treatment rather than acid reflux patient. Gastroesophageal reflux patient mostly have a liquid type, non-GERD have a gas type, treatment of the PBI or proton bump inhibitor doesn't decrease the amount of the reflux, but rather converting reflux to non-acidic or weakly acidic type. Uh, the, fourth type, uh, the fourth investigation is the endoscopic evaluation with biopsy. No doubt, it is most sensitive. However, it is most invasive. The North American Society of the Pediatric Enterologists and Hepatologists developed guidelines to do endoscopy. These guidelines is indicated for number one, infant and children with gastroesophageal reflux that fail to respond to the drug treatment. Number two, initial workout for presentation of weight loss, unexplained anemia, fetal occult blood recurrent pneumonia. Number three, if we suspect Barrett esophagus. So in this stage, we in this uh, situation, we need to stage the severity of the esophagitis and also to exclude uh, dysplasia or malignancy. So endoscopy is indicated. We have what's called Safari Miller's grades for grading endoscopic finding. Five grades, grade zero uh, or O, normal osteogenic epithelium, grade one, single erosion, grade two, multiple erosions, and grade three, circular erosions, grade four, ulcer, finally, grade five, uh, five, the Barrett epithelium. However, it is important that this grading is observer impression. So you mandatory to take biopsy had to detect thickening of the basal layers indicating pathological reflux. Also what's called intra-epithelial eosinophilia. Eosinophilia will diagnose esophagitis and the presence of reflux. The fifth investigation is the evaluation for delayed gastric emitting. Is it essential? Previously, pyloroblasty was performed at the time of fundoblication to improve gastric emitting. However, recent studies showing that gastroparesis doesn't improve significantly, or uh, doesn't improve significantly when emptying the procedure is performed at the time of anti-reflux. So gastroparesis is still present, uh, even in uh, performance of emptying studies. Also, they found that patient with delayed gastric emptying improved for both solid and the fluid after fundoblication alone. So fundoblication may improve the gastric emptying. 
So currently, evaluation of the gastric emptying is not recommended prior to initial fundoplication, unless if we suspect that second operative intervention would place this child at significant morbidity or mortality. So it may be wise to perform investigation for delayed gastro, uh, gastric emptying in a child needing second or third fundoplication as it may be this delayed gastric emptying the cause for failure or the cause for rap transmigration. So when we go to this debate, preoperative imaging studies to do or not to do. Over the last five years, actually many centers moving away from preoperative imaging studies unless the data obtained will be helpful in planning or managing the patient operative care. Therefore, history and symptoms complex is the most important cornerstone when evaluating the children referred for fundoplication. Impedance study may be helpful in certain situations. We can take the following example, neurologically impaired study, neurologically impaired child referred for gastrostomy and has been on proton bump inhibitor therapy. In this situation, it is unclear if this child has a significant reflux or not. So impedance study will be helpful if fundoplication need to be performed at the time of the gastrostomy or not. Very common scenario and very common situation in the incubators. Recently, uh, some centers managing patients based on the clinical symptoms rather than the radiological investigation. However, the preoperative investigations usually needed in patients with confusing history and symptoms complex. Now we will go to management of the gastroesophageal reflux disease. We have two arms of management, conservative and surgery. Actually, conservative therapy indicated in infant and young children because we suspect spontaneous normalization. However, it is unlikely if there are pathology like hiatus hernia, volvulus, obstructions, tracheosophageal fistula, uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, mental disability, no healing. Also, when it's severe esophagitis or reflux related to stenosis, it must be treated before surgery. And in those rare patients unable to undergo surgery in all these items, conservative therapy is indicated. We have three items for the conservative, parenteral reassurance, dietary modification, and positional adaptation. Parenteral reassurance, you must show sympathy for the expected impaired infant quality of life and parent anxiety and distress you must give them more sympathy and th followed by dietary modification. You need to make the formula more thick to reduce the regurgitations. And this uh, is approved by both European and North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterologist. Positional adaptation, as we said before, related to the effect of gravity. The prone position with raised torso will prevent reflux. However, this prone is no longer recommended owing to what is known as sudden infant death. So nowadays, supine position with raised torso is become the generally recommended position for treatment of GERD. Uh, regarding drugs, drugs aiming to reduce the exposure of the esophagus uh, to the acid. These drugs whether protect the mucosal surface or reduce or prevent productions of gastric juice. Drugs that protect the mucosal surface, we have uh, one famous drug known as sacral fit, which is aluminum complex in the form of gel. It improves the symptoms of esophagitis, reduce signs of inflammation. Drugs that block the production of the gastric acids may be hydrogen receptor antagonist, reduce gastric acid secretions. However, it has no effect on the gastric acids induced by meal. Therefore, the second more effective and more potent is proton bump inhibitor. 
uh, not effective against uh, reflux that is not due to acid reflux, which is a weakness or a disadvantage for protein bound. Moreover, there is a lack of evidence of effectiveness uh, of these proton bump inhibitors in the unit. However, many physicians still prescribe them. Proton bump is indicated in recurrent unquietness, pain related symptoms when there is acid reflux, volume clearance, take a long time. Uh, we have this situation, especially in patients undergoing tracheosophageal fistula repair, when the lower segment was extensively mobilized during surgery. Moreover, infant with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, incompetent cardia, infant with severe mental disorders may benefit from proton bump inhibitors. The efficacy must be checked after two weeks of treatment, as the dose may need to be increased or modified individually. Uh, second drug therapy is what's called gamma amino butyric acid receptor antagonist or baclofen. Baclofen, these drugs in the new one cause inhibition of the transient uh, lower sphenectric relaxation. Used in children with GERD, also in refractory GERD. The third types of drug is a prokinetic drugs. All of us know the cisabride, chose utilized then it was taken from the market owing to the side effects of the cardiac toxicity. Metclopromide, dobromine also have a similar cardiac toxicity as cisabride. So currently no effective brokinetic agent on the market, which is the final conclusion regarding the brokinetic drugs present to treat gastroesophageal reflux. Therefore, from these previous data, some authors consider fundoglycation as a good initial therapeutic options. Arguing that, number one, medical therapy doesn't seem to be a long-term solution. Maybe in a short term, it will give a good result. However, regarding long term, it's not a good long-term solution. Number two, it is largely ineffective medical treatment for young infant and those with non-acid reflux, alkaline or neutral reflux. Now we will shift to operative management, fundoblication. Operative management indicated for field medical therapy for the gross failure or failure to, grab, to thrive or failure to gain weight. Number two, for symptomatic children with comorbidities such as neurologically impaired child, child with congenital anomalies. Fundoblication without trial of medical therapy. This is nowadays a debate. To start fundoblication from the start without trial of medical therapy. What are the indications for this line of treatment? Number one, selected situation, including Patient in the ICU with respiratory symptoms requiring gastrostomy. It is reasonable to perform fundoblication with gastrostomy for this type of patient. Number two, a neurologically impaired child needing gastrostomy, and there is a concern for aspiration. Commonly seen, a decision to do fundoblication with gastrostomy should be individualized. We can take an example. Neurologically impaired infant with difficult oral intake and required tube feeding, but no symptoms of reflux. This infant, gastrostomy alone, is very reasonable because there is no symptoms of reflux, no respiratory problem. The only problem is difficult oral intake. So gastrostomy will solve this problem. On the other side, neurologically impaired child cannot swallow and require the tube feeding in the ICU due to respiratory disease. Due to respiratory disease, so this infant probably have reflux with multiple aspiration. So in this case, fundoblication in addition to gastrostomy is a very reasonable and must be performed. The third indication is infant who present with 
a life-threatening spill. This infant, we must start with fund obligation without trial of medical surgery. So GERD is documented, no other etiology. This beast managed with a fund obligation as initial therapy. So there are three indications to start with fund obligation without initial therapy. The second indication uh, after the selected situation is a peritosophagitis and esophageal restriction. If we have a child already diagnosed with peritosophagitis or esophageal restrictions, usually Barrett will resolve after fund duplication. However, lifelong endoscopic uh, follow up is needed. Regarding strictures, esophageal dilatations should be performed with fund duplication, and the child may need subsequent dilatation in severe cases. The third indication, children with hiatal hernia need to be done, treated with fund duplication as initial treatment, as these children usually don't respond to the medical treatment. So we have selected situation, we have children with hiatal hernia, we have children with uh, peritosophagitis and esophageal structure. All this situation indicated to perform initial fund duplication without trial for medical therapy. Uh, now we can go very rapidly at the operative technique describing laparoscopic some key spots. As we see, this is the orientation for the child. Patient placed at the end of the table, surgeon stand at the foot of the table, assistant and the cameraman to the surgeon right and the scrub nurse to the surgeon left. Infant placed frog leg positions, older children lysotomy, we must take care for the neurologically impaired child because they have a contractures and we need to put uh, adequate padding of their pressure point to avoid fractures or disabilities. We perform five millimeter vertical incision, umbilical score down to the umbilical fascia, and we keep nemoperitoneum at about 12, 12 to 15 millimeter mercury, diagnostic laparoscopy is then follow and four step incision. As we see, uh, this is a step incision, this is liver retractors, and this is two working in instrument, and this is the assistant uh, in instrument. In older children, we may put harmonic scalpel uh, plus the other, the same other three incisions. The superior or short gastric must be ligated. Retroesophageal window uh, is created from the patient left side. Prefer to perform it from the left patient left side because it is easy after ligation and division of short gastric. However, still, some surgeons prefer to start from the right side, pars condensa. Once the gastroesophageal junction on the left side identified, the stomach is flipped to the patient left and the gastrohepatic ligament is incised to expose the right side uh, as we see, fund obligation wrap must be positioned above the left gastric rather than inferior to it. And if there is a small hiatal hernia, either uh, present or uh, induced by the dissection, it must be closed with two O silk sutures. Then we can introduce a budget. Appropriate budget size for the neonates is well uh, developed and used according to the weight per ki by kilogram up to 15 kilograms. Fund obligations performed with three sutures. As we know, the most superior one must incorporate small portions of the anterior esophagus to anchor the wrap around the abdominal esophagus. Lens of fund obligation, usually starting, we need uh, two centi, up to two and a half to three, depend on the age of the child. Uh, regarding gastrostomy, if we need to perform a gastrostomy, the left mid epigastric port area is used for the extraorization of the gastrostomy. If fund duplication not present, we can keep the same site. However, this site must be marked before nemoperitoneum, as nemoperitoneum will distort this site. So uh, we need to keep the gastrostomy away from the costal margin. Then we introduce silicon caster in the stomach to avoid including the backward with sutures, which is very important. Then we take two BDS sutures uh, through the abdominal wall and the stomach and back through the abdominal wall to fix the gastrostomy to the anterior abdominal wall. We can use dilators to serially dilate the anterior abdominal wall and gastrostomy according to the age infant, maybe uh, 16 or older children, we may need to use 20 uh, French dilators. 
gastrostomy placed and fixed under visualization. And we can confirm that there is uh, that the gastrostomy inside the stomach, there is no leakage using the laparoscope or the angled telescope. Now we go to the post operative care. How to care these children post operative? If we perform gastrostomy, feeding can be started several hours later and advanced over the evening and the next morning. However, if gastrostomy is not performed, we can allow liquid several hours after the procedure. Yes, uh, about uh, more than 90% of patients discharged after surgery. On the day after surgery, parent instructed about how to use a gastrostomy, how to advance feeding, and the patient will be full in the outpatient clinic. It's important to mention to the family that there is, will be an edema around the post, around the fundal issue. Therefore, for the first three weeks, diet must be mechanical soft diet. Uh, some diets like meat and pizza not allowed because these foods be, will become lodged above the fund application. Uh, after three weeks, the edema uh, will subside and these types of diet can be introduced gradually. Patients are seen at two and three, uh, two weeks, three months, six months, one year after surgery. Uh, upper GI contrast study performed after one year to evaluate for the RAP transmigrations or other abnormalities. Regarding complication of the fund obligations, actually the mortality rate is very low. Immediate postoperative complications about 5 to 20 percent with laparoscopic surgery, including perforation, bleeding, and pneumothorax. The most common complication is recurrent reflux. Recurrent reflux may be occur with all types of fund obligation, complete or incomplete, may be related to uh, what is described as a physiological movement of the diaphragm or mobility or motions in this area with respiration. Some authors described that the esophagus may be shortened during the act of swallowing in adult uh, literatures described this. The risk factors for this recurrence may be the age uh, below six years in some paper describing that, hiatus hernia, neurologically impaired children, because these children will have frequent shocking, planching, uh, ruminations, market catabolism. So you must add uh, parenteral calories to keep the child on the anabolic side rather than the catabolic side, especially in this subset of patient. Common lead complications, all of us know what's called gas plot syndrome due to smaller gastric volume, very tight trap, dysphagia, postoperative pain, this temporally inability to vomit seen specifically after missing fund obligation as it is a form of complete rabbing around the esophagus. Other surgical methods may be used in a case of gastroesophageal reflux disease, what's called coolis gastroblasty, very rare, the fundus is separated at the point of angle of his to elongate the esophagus and then fund obligation performed. So it is performed in the cases of short esophagus. Uh, mucosal flap creation at the cardiac is endoscopic method by a special endoscopic stibler. The fold is supposed to prevent reflux. A straight up procedure, this is also endoscopic methods used successively in children. Thermal damage, applying thermal damage at the cardia with the use of the radio waves. This is some recent techniques, endoscopically or non surgical. Submucosal implant, maybe we have submucosal implant injected at the cardia to prevent reflux, uh, similar to the idea of injecting dyscoeuretric reflux. However, the long term experience of these methods is lacking, and the current data don't favor its use. Lennox device, also a non-endoscopic technique, a ring of uh, magnetic beads is placed around the esophagus during laparoscopy. Electric lower esophageal sphincter stimulator. This is non-endoscopic also, implantation of electric stimulator supposed to improve the lower esophageal sphincter pressure and the prevent reflux. Also gastrostomy. Gastrostomy is very important uh, actually in a child with mental disabilities. In case of insufficient oral feeding, fund obligation should be combined with gastrostomy so that food may be supplemented via this gastrostomy. And lastly, 
the what's called uh, esophagogastric uh, dissection or dissociation, complete separation of the esophagus from the stomach. This complete separation indicated in severe cases of mental disability because these patients will develop numerous recurrent refluxes, uh, extensive rumination uh, and refluxes. So it is advisable to perform what is known as esophagogastric disconnection procedure or esophagogastric dissociation, which simply means complete separation of the esophagus and the stomach, then performing row and y and stomosis between the esophagus and the jejunum to restore continuity of the gastrointestinal tract. Stomach separated, uh, esophago jejunostomy row and y is created, thus the food reaches the jejunum directly and recurrent reflexes or ruminations are prevented. Finally, we will go to speak about the outcomes. Actually, this is very important. The outcome following the all surgical procedure, especially found application by missing procedure. The item needed to be covered is what about the transmigration of the found application rep? Uh, what about minimal versus extensive osophageal mobilization? Uh, what about the esophagocrural suture? Is it essential or not? What about the laparoscopic versus openness in fund obligation regarding parenteral satisfactions with this type of surgery? Fund obligation after gastrostomy, open gastrostomy versus endoscopic, anterior fund obligations versus nissen, and finally the redo fund obligation. Transmigration of the fund obligation rep. Uh, what are the causes for this? What will make the fund obligation wrap to transmigrate up to the chest? Maybe extensive superficial mobilization. The surgeon aims to create two centi or more lengths for intra-abdominal esophagus and cut the free esophageal membrane and make extensive esophageal and hiatal dissection. Maybe non-obliteration of the space between the esophagus and the crura, so the wrap will go up it's responsible for about 12% of the redo procedure. To reduce incidence of the post-operative transmigration or rep transmigration, uh, number one, we need minimal esophageal mobilization. Number two, we need to keep the ferino esophageal membrane in its children. We speak about the procedure in its children, unlike adult. Adult need to create large intra-abdominal esophagus. Actually, this is not true in its children. Also, the space between the esophagus and crura should be closed. Whether with two suture, with four suture, however, it must be closed to prevent disease rap migration. Regarding the debate about minimal or extensive esophageal mobilization, the, the efficacy of the mobilization was evaluated. With recent prospective randomized trial, the primary outcome for these trials was the transmigration of the rap and was planned to include 360 patients. However, the surprise, patient randomized in two groups. First group undergo minimal esophageal mobilization. Second group, extensive mobilization, aiming to create two centi lens of the intra-abdominal esophagus. However, uh, also the patient uh, randomized according to neurologic status, and the authors perform upper GI contrast at one year to evaluate for rap transmigration. The surprise is that the study was stopped early after 177 patients. Why? As finding favored minimal esophageal mobilization. Authors found 8% transmigration rate versus 30% in the extensive dissection group. Also, they found that a low rate of the redo dissection group versus uh, high rate. Uh, for the redo in the extensive versus low, very low rate in the minimum dissection group. So the authors recommend that minimal esophageal dissections in children without hiatal hernia to decrease the rate of post-operative transmigration of fundoblication rep. Regarding esophagocrural sutures, are we need for these sutures to close the potential space between the esophagus and the crura? It was also evaluated by prospective randomized study. 
to identify whether it is essential or not. Uh, the study include minimal esophageal dissections for early patient, and the primary outcome was a post-operative rap migration. Group one, undergoing found duplication with no suture. Group two, found duplication with four esophagocrural sutures and excluding cases with preoperative hiatal hernia, as this will need sutures already. Operative time was significantly longer in the suture group by about 20 minutes, which is expected. Contrast the study obtained at one year and surprise that there is no rap herniation in either group, whether performing esophagocrural sutures or not. However, rap loosening is found in non-suture group in the reduced surgery, no reduced surgery in the suture group and reflux symptoms and the medication were not different. They recommended that, this is the conclusion, placement of the esophagocrural suture doesn't offer any advantage and it increased the operative time in laparoscopic fundal glycation. Despite the child has no uh, or not have uh, hiatal hernia. Osphagocrural sutures used only in the presence of hiatal hernia. Minimal esophageal dissection and mobilization should be applied in all patients. So this is the debate. However, many pediatric surgeons is still apply one or two esophagocrural sutures to close the defect that is already present or created during minimal esophageal dissection. Laparoscopic versus open, what is the best? In recent randomized studies looking at the outcome following fund duplication compared to the recurrence of GERD in children undergoing lab versus open medicine. 44 children undergoing lab and 43 undergoing uh, uh, open. Primary outcome was recurrence and they defined the recurrence as symptoms combined with reflux index more than four on the pH monitoring or herniated wrap on the upper GI study. Most operative follow-up, they perform 24-hour pH monitoring, upper GI study, clinical examinations at six months and phone interview. They found in patient undergoing laparoscopic about 37 experienced recurrence versus 7% in the open fundal glycation. They conclude in this study that laparoscopic has a higher recurrence rate of the care than the open fundoblication. Another report evaluating the four-year result following fundoblication recurrence rate documented by the upper GI study, 20 patients has been randomized to open uh, labor, uh, and uh, open fundoblication. The incidence of, of GERD was about 12.5 uh, in the open compared to 20 in the laparoscopic group. However, only one patient in each group required redo found duplication. Regarding nutritional status and the quality of life, it was improved in both groups. Also laparoscopic associated with reduced incidence of reaching better cosmotic with less hospital stay. In monocentric retrospective study performed on children operated with found duplication, 119 patients with mean age of 4.8 years undergo found applications. At six months, uh, the patient required second surgery were evaluated. So they concluded that majority of the children needed to restart their anti-reflux medications within six months after found application surgery, which is very important. So you must inform the parent that you will restart again your anti-reflux medications about six months after surgery. Regarding parental satisfactions, it's very important the parent is satisfied or not about the result of fund application. Recent study looked at the need for fund application after initial gastrostomy alone, uh, in uh, there is high satisfaction reported improved gastrointestinal reflux symptoms and high level of satisfaction following fundoblication. Fundoblication after initial gastrostomy, uh, about 
600 uh, patient undergoing gastrostomy. Subsequent fundoglycation was needed in 62 patients with a mean interval after gastrostomy. Cerebral palsy and the brain injury, most common significant correlation for the need for subsequent fundoglycation. Interestingly, laparoscopic gastrostomy has better impact for the need for the subsequent uh, need for uh, fundoglycation. Open gastrostomy versus endoscopic gastrostomy. We have also study looking to at the outcome following open gastrostomy and percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. Uh, another study evaluating about 26 neurologically impaired children undergoing laparoscopic gastrostomy if their GERD improved or worsened postoperatively. After evaluations, author concluded that laparoscopic approach reduced GERD in the neurologically impaired patient by improving gastric emptying. Anterior hemifundoblication versus nascent fundoblication. The use of the anterior hemifundoblication evaluated for quality of life found significant improvement for children and their patient with improved uh, in their symptoms. Redo fundoblication. It's very important to comment on the redo fundoblications as considerable time and effort were spent trying to prevent the need for redo. The use of the mesh was described to enhance hiatal repair at the time of the redo fundoblication, many times in adult retreaters. Uh, we have a retrospective report published uh, reviewing the redo following initial nascent fundoblication uh, for about 13 years. Uh, more than 700 laparoscopic anti reflux surgery, about uh, 82 or about 10% required redo. 15 of these required more than redo surgery. In comparing patients requiring more than redo with patients required one redo, no difference in the age or use of mesh or time to subsequent operation. So these items had no difference. However, authors reported that two essential modifications may reduce the need for redo fund application. These modifications including minimal esophageal mobilization and dissection. Number two, suture obliterations of the potential space between the esophagus and the core. These two items decrease the need for redo or second surgery after fund application. And we have recent report using these modifications found that the number of the patient requiring a redo fund application reduced, obviously. And also RAB transmigration rate reduced, uh, obviously, after using these modifications. Minimal esophageal dissection, closure of the potential space between the esophagus and the core. Very important modification in children. Also, RAB disruption decreased rather than RAB. Uh, RAB disruptions remain uh, the main cause of redo, and RAB my transmigration decreased after using this modification. They concluded that if the patient required redo, the risk of uh, requiring redo surgery after that one is decreased. Also, uh, Bansal uh, published experience with about um, 25 to laparoscopic redo found application. 44 patients undergo previous open and 32 more than one. Reported post-operative complication rate, RAP failure with the most common cause is RAP transmigration. Now we will go to ask a question about what are the exact mechanisms by which found application remove or improve uh, GERD symptoms? Actually, the answer remain unclear. What happened after fundoblication? How fundoblication prevent reflux? It may be, there is some suggestion that it may be mechanical effect, what's called as pull valve phenomenon. As liquid and food enter the stomach cannot return it back due to presence of fundoblication. Pull valve phenomenon, maybe mechanical. Maybe angle of Hess is accentuated 
after fundoplication, and we know that angular face is one of the barriers against reflux. Maybe that fundoplication will prevent only high volume reflux. And this prevention for high volume reflux may cause um, increased mucosal integrity up to the middle of the esophagus. This will decrease the symptomatology, help in improving the patient complaint. Maybe, maybe after fundoplication, there is marked reductions in the number of the reflux episode, especially proximal reflux. We mean by proximal reflux is that the reflux reaching the upper esophagus or even regurgitation in the mouth. So all of these items try to explain the mechanism by which the fundoplication prevent reflux. Maybe the nissen decreased the number and magnitude of lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. All of these are expectation by which mechanism fundoplication prevent reflux. The final one, some authors claim that nissen fundoplication disrupt the vagal input to the gastroesophageal junction, which is associated with reduction in the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation may be a mechanism to prevent or reduce reflux. Uh, in conclusion, laparoscopic fundoplication is an evolving technique for surgical management of GERD. In children, no doubt that the children will have a less post-operative discomfort, earlier hospital discharge, faster return to school. However, operative technique continue to need further evaluation, proper data collection, critical analysis. So at the end uh, of this subject, we must know that fundoplication is very important for treatment of reflux. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux is a serious disease in infant and children with major consequences. Uh, these consequences are most dangerous than that of adult. Uh, neurologically impaired children form a subset of children in which children we may uh, need to use different treatment. We may need to be very aggressive. We may need uh, to do fundoplication from the start. Uh, even we may need to uh, do esophagogastric dissociation or disconnection. Uh, fundoplication outcomes is good. Uh, there are uh, many papers describing some modification specific for children related to the minimal esophageal dissections, the closure of the potential space between the esophagus and the crora. All these items help to reduce the redo, the need for the redo surgery to improve the patient's symptoms, and finally, to improve the outcome. Uh, at the point, laparoscopic fundoplication, especially nascent fundoplication, provide a good uh, solutions for the GERD problem. However, continuous evaluations and experience of the surgeon need to be increased uh, to increase or uh, impact on the operative outcome of the children. Thank you very much. Uh, and see you next, next subject on pediatric surgery. Thank you.